Welcome to my online video lecture of Chapter 28, Sources of Magnetic Fields. Let's begin by reviewing what we learned in Chapter 27. We defined magnets, talked about what materials become magnetized, and discussed the concept of a magnet's magnetic field as being the way in which it affects other magnetic materials in its vicinity. Um, we further define that the direction of the magnetic field is leaving the north pole of the magnet and moving around toward the south pole. And that's a convention that we're going to continue to use throughout these chapters. Recall that we define Gauss's law for magnetism as describing the observation that in nature no magnetic monopoles exist. So every magnetic field line that leaves a surface eventually comes back around and goes back into the surface, leaving a net flux through that surface, magnetic flux, of zero. Finally, we discuss ways in which magnets and magnetic fields interact and how they're interrelated with electric currents and moving charges. This is the basis for why magnets and magnetism are extremely important in the field of electricity and magnetism. Um, recall the two observations that were noted. The first is electric currents or otherwise moving electric charges will experience a force due to external magnetic fields. Electric currents generate magnetic field lines in circle patterns as per the right hand rules discussed. We've gone through several examples of these two specifically examples of the right hand rule, examples of how external magnetic fields affect currents and affect moving charges in general. So we've already described observation one and gone over example problems related to it in chapter 27. Now what we're going to do in chapter 28 is talk about this observation two in more detail. So this is what it's all about in chapter 28. Um, we're going to use two different methods to define magnetic fields around current carrying wires. The first is called Biot-Savart. Um, the second is called Ampere's Law. And then we're going to wrap up the chapter by talking a little bit about magnetic materials and their behaviors. Now, in order to formulate the Biot-Savart Law, we're going to start out with just an individual point charge, moving with velocity v as shown to the right. We want to ask ourselves, what magnetic field is generated at the point p shown on the upper right due to this moving charge? We're going to define the radial direction, which is r hat. We're going to define the distance between point p and our charge, which is the distance r. And we're going to define the angle between that r hat vector and our velocity vector. The angle is phi. Experimentally, it can be determined that the magnetic field at this point P is proportional to the absolute value of the charge Q, proportional to its speed, inversely proportional to the distance squared between these two points, and proportional to the sine of phi. Putting all of these together, we get our proportionality relationship. But in order to make that something usable, we need to find the proportionality constant, which has also been determined experimentally. That constant is going to be given a value of mu sub 0 over 4 pi. Now mu sub 0 is nothing more than a constant, which is called the magnetic permeability in a vacuum. Mu sub zero itself has the value 4 pi times 10 to the negative seventh tesla meters per ampere, giving the proportionality constant a value of 1 times 10 to the negative seventh tesla meters per ampere. Now what we have is a way of calculating the magnitude of the magnetic field at point P. What we really want is a vector equation that gives us its direction. In order to do that, we notice that sine phi is actually the sine of the angle between the velocity vector and the r hat vector. So it turns out that this is a cross product equation as shown. What you have here is the complete equation for measuring magnetic fields 
of a moving point charge at all points in space. All right, now we need to take a step back and discuss what Biot-Savart law is. Um, Biot-Savart describes the magnetic field due to something called a current element. And what a current element is, is just a very small segment of wire that flows current. And um, if you know the effect of that little piece of wire, then you can use that and integrate it to get the effect of an entire uh, real life wire. Well, what we have now is a complete equation that deals with moving point charges. But what we really want is Biot-Savart law, which deals with collections of charges or currents. Um, so to go between one individual charge and a collection of charges or current, uh, we recall what we did in chapter 27. Basically what we did was Q times V gives us charge times distance over time, whereas IL gives us charge over time times distance. So replacing the QV term in this equation with IDL, which is the length of our current element, gives us the Biot-Savart law at last. So Biot-Savart tells us what the magnetic field is of a current element. In order to get the magnetic field of various geometries, we need to integrate those elements. So that's what the bottom of this slide is showing. And next, I'm going to go through examples of how we might do that using Biot-Savart. OK, so this first example is that of an infinite wire. Now, we've seen this derived for electric fields of wires. Now we're going to see the magnetic field of this wire. Um, as we can see by the right hand rule, placing our fingers in the direction of our DL vector, which really points in the same direction as dy, wave them in the r hat vector direction, we should find that the magnetic field points inward as shown. The next thing we need to do is identify our variables here. So the variables that are going to actually change throughout the integration, one is y, which is going to go from negative infinity to infinity. Another is theta, which is going to go from 0 at negative infinity to pi at positive infinity, as you can see. And then, of course, the r vector will change throughout that integration. So we have really three separate variables that we need to um, combine into one or eliminate in some way. So here's our Biot-Savart law shown up top. We need to put our variables into that equation. And as we can see, our dl really is dy here. Um, and our phi is actually listed as theta for this problem, so we're going to use theta. And there you have the uh, infinitesimal magnetic field dB with our variables in place. Now we have to start eliminating variables. So let's try and get everything in terms of theta. So the first thing we want to do is eliminate any variables related to y, y and dy. To do that, um, notice that uh, y is going to be equal to negative r over tangent theta. Now why is this the case? Because tangent theta is equal to opposite, with, which is r, over um, adjacent, which is y. And notice that we're in the negative y plane, so that's why the negative sign's there because we have a negative y value here, and that's equal to r over tangent theta. So what that leads to is taking the derivative with respect to theta. You need to use the chain rule for this, so please pause this and take time to do this math if you're interested. Simplifying gives this equation, which is nothing more than r over sine squared theta. So now we have a way to the dy variable in terms of theta. That's really what we want. Putting that into the equation above gives this equation. Now that we have that, we need to eliminate the r variable. Writing r in terms of theta um, can be done as follows. So sine theta is equal to r over small r. And that means that r squared is capital R squared over sine squared theta. 
And that means that 1 over r squared is sine squared theta over r squared. If we plug that in, then we get this equation. Now what we have is db in terms of only theta variables and constants. If we pull all of the constants out and simplify, then the equation we're left with is uh, an equation that only has to do with theta, and it's definitely something that we can integrate. To get the total magnetic field of the infinite wire, what we need to do is integrate sine theta d theta which is going to give us negative cosine theta with our limits of integration 0 to pi as mentioned before. And when we plug in the limits we have our result. B is equal to mu sub 0 i over 2 pi r and that is the magnetic field very close to a current carrying wire or the magnetic field at all points along an infinite wire. Since there are no infinite wires in space, what we're really interested in is measuring and quantifying the magnetic field close to a wire carrying current. Example number two. We want to determine the magnetic field due to a single coil of wire. As shown, magnetic field lines make circular paths around this wire and we can see in this picture how the magnetic field is going to point. And if you can put your fingers in the direction of the DL vector, which actually points out of the page, and wave them in the R hat direction, you should see that the magnetic field does indeed point in this way. First thing to notice here is looking at the Biot-Savart equation using theta as our variable, you can't see theta in this picture, but actually it's 90 degrees. And you should be able to see that if you put your fingers in the direction of DL and wave them toward R, you'll notice that they're going to make a 90 degree angle. The equation can simplify then, as shown. And if you notice, as we integrate around the circle of the loop, Vertical components on the upper half of the loop will eventually cancel with components due to the bottom half of the loop. We've seen this also when we did electric fields for circles. So what we really want is dBx, the x component of the magnetic field. And so what we're going to have to do is multiply by cosine phi as shown. Cosine phi is capital R over lowercase r or adjacent over hypotenuse. And so what that leads to is B being the integral of mu sub 0 i r over 4 pi lowercase r cubed dl. Now the only variable in that entire equation is dl that has to be integrated. Everything else is a constant. So what are our limits of integration? Well, we're going around a circle, so it's from 0 to 2 pi times the radius. If we perform that integration, we see that we can do some cancellations here. Once we cancel and simplify, we're left with this equation, mu sub 0 i r squared over 2 pi, uh, excuse me, 2 lowercase r cubed. But lowercase r is the hypotenuse of a right triangle, r squared plus x squared to the 1 half. So plugging in, we see that r cubed is r squared plus x squared to the 3 halves. And if we put that into the magnetic field equation, we have our final result, magnetic field on the axis of a single current loop. Now this is a complex, semi-complex equation, but what we can do is determine what the magnetic field would look like at the center of the current loop. At the center of the current loop, x is equal to 0, and the equation simplifies to mu sub 0 i over 2 r. Now why is this equation beneficial? It's beneficial because when we start looking at solenoids later on, chapter 29, 
we are going to have n turns of a coil and the magnetic field would simply be n times mu sub zero i over 2r. Example three, looking at this shape, which seems to be a quarter of a circle with ends attached. Okay, so for here, what we're going to do is take advantage of cross products and symmetry. One thing that we notice is the current and the radial direction pointing towards C, which is our pointing question, um, point in the same direction at each end. So recall that we do I DL cross R. Well, here the cross product at the ends is going to give us a value of zero. DL cross R equals zero for the ends only, and ends do not contribute to the field for that reason. So we can think of this shape as just being a quarter circle, as if the ends weren't there. And that means that the magnetic field is going to be a quarter of the value as if it were a circle. We know the field for a circle loop, which is mu sub zero i over 2r. So we have a quarter of that. And the final result is mu sub zero i over 8r. This concludes the BO sub r examples. Be sure to come to class Wednesday and go over practice problems with the learning assistant. Okay, so now what we're going to do is discuss the second method of calculating magnetic fields. This method is known as Ampere's law. You'll find some similarities between Ampere's law and Gauss's law for electricity um, in that we are setting up an enclosed surface um, and integrating around that surface. So Ampere's law says that the closed integral around a surface dotted with the magnetic field should give you mu sub zero times whatever current you have enclosed. Now what we need to do is define what it means to have the current enclosed. Basically what it means is that um, the surface bounded by your path um, needs to have the current passing through it as shown on the right here. Um, the other thing is that there's a right hand rule associated with Ampere's law. So putting your fingers in the direction of the integration path as shown, um, positive currents would point in the direction of your thumb of your right hand as shown. So if that current were flip-flopped, it would be a negative current. So currently in the picture that you're looking at, we have a positive current coming out at us because the integration path goes counterclockwise. Um, so, going through Ampere's law a little bit, testing does this work for simple geometries. What we're looking at now is a straight wire flowing current through a circular path. The first thing we note is that the magnetic field is constant along this path and goes in the same direct the direction as the DL vectors. So we can pull out the dot product and pull out the magnetic field out of the integral. Also, we notice that we have one current here and it's a positive current. So mu sub zero i enclosed equals mu sub zero i. So Ampere's law gives the integral of b dot dl is equal to mu sub zero i. So b times the integral of dl around the circular path gives mu sub zero i. And that means that b times 2 pi r equals mu sub zero i. And that means that b is equal to mu sub zero i over 2 pi r. And notice that this is the same result that we got using b o sub r, only with a lot less math, similar to Gauss's law for electricity. Now let's look at the case where we have a negative current. Now, why is this current negative? If we put the right hand fingers in the direction of the integration path, which is in this case clockwise, we see that positive currents would go into the page. Here the current is going out of the page, so it's a negative current. Same math as before, only now we have 
negative b times dl because if you notice the b vectors go opposite dl so when we do the dot product we're going to get cosine of pi which gives us the negative sign so b dot dl equals negative b dl and mu sub zero i enclosed now we still have one current i only now it's negative this gives an equation that says negative the integral of b dot uh, excuse me of b dl is equal to negative mu sub zero i The two negatives cancel and we're left with virtually the same result. So Ampere's law seems to work with enclosed currents. So far, so good. Now let's look at a case where we have no current enclosed. So if you look at this picture on the right-hand side, you note that the current is not enclosed by our bounding surface. The integral of b dot dl on that surface it can be thought of as the dot product of the magnetic field and the path on each side of the surface. So for the top right curve, we have b for that curve times the length of the curve times cosine 0 because if you look, the magnetic field and the dl vectors make the same um, angle with one another. Uh, plus on the two straight surfaces, the magnetic field makes a 90 degree angle, so we can see that those surfaces are going to contribute nothing. Plus BCD LCD cosine zero for the bottom half of this curve. So simplifying, we get the integral of B dot DL is equal to BAB LAB minus BCD LCD. And we can see, because we're dealing with arc lengths here, LAB is equal to R1 theta, and LCD is equal to R2 theta. And that means that the integral of B dot DL is equal to BAB R1 theta minus BCD R2 theta. But we already know for a current carrying wire from our previous result, b is equal to mu sub zero i over 2 pi r. So let's see what happens when we plug that into the equation above. Plugging in, we see we have an r1 on the numerator of each term and an r1 in the denominator. Canceling these r1s gives identical terms, and the difference of those identical terms yields zero. So it seems like Ampere's law works fine when no current is enclosed and when a current is enclosed. So what is Ampere's law? To summarize, it's a way of calculating magnetic field for simple geometries where the integration is straightforward. Just as Gauss's law for electricity is a way of calculating electric field when the integration is simple. Note that if you have multiple conductors going through your bounded surface, you're going to have to pay attention to what direction each current leads, positive or negative. Let's look at an example of how we would use Ampere's law. So this example is to derive an equation to calculate the magnetic field strength, B, versus the radius from the center of a very long wire. So looking at the image on the right-hand side, we're concerned with the inside circle, the dotted line, inside this cylindrical conductor. And so we start out with Ampere's law. And we notice that the amount of current enclosed is a function of the area ratios. So I enclosed is equal to I total times pi r squared over pi capital R squared. canceling out the pi's and so what we're left with is b is equal to mu sub zero i over 2 pi r r squared over r squared notice that the two r cancel and we're left with our final result and the graph on the bottom right hand side shows how this magnetic field will look for radial distances, both inside and outside the cylinder.
Let's look at example two. This is an example of a solenoid. Recall that a solenoid is a tightly packed series of windings or coils. We can see on the left-hand image that the magnetic field for loosely packed coils will be ripply inside, but magnetic field for tightly packed coils will be roughly uniform and straight right and left here, horizontally. So we're going to choose our bounding path as the rectangle shown on the bottom. There's The reason for this is, if you notice, the magnetic field is sparse outside of the solenoid. So we can neglect the magnetic field on segment AB. So taking Ampere's law, um, B dot DL as the sum of magnetic field dotted with lengths on either side, each of the sides of this rectangle. So BAB times L cosine zero, um, BBC, LBC, notice that that path, it makes a 90 degree angle with the magnetic field. So that is going to give us nothing. Um, plus BCD, which is inside the solenoid, times its length times cosine zero. Simplifying this, the only thing we're left with is BCD times L. And how much current is enclosed? Well, if we look here, all of the current goes in the same direction. And doing the right hand rule, we see these are positive currents. And so we're left with the number of turns N times the current going through one turn as our I enclosed. And so we're e easily able to calculate our final result, which is nothing more than BCD times L is equal to mu sub zero N times I, or BCD, which is B solenoid, is equal to mu sub zero N I over L. We can also replace the capital N over L by lowercase n, which is the number of turns per unit length yielding a well-known result for a solenoid's magnetic field. So this is how we use Ampere's law. Please come to class Wednesday and work with the learning assistant to practice.